Older adults, those aged 60 or above, make important contributions to society as family members, volunteers, and as active participants in the workforce. While most have good mental health, many older adults are at risk of developing mental disorders, neurological disorders, or substance use problems, as well as other health conditions such as diabetes, hearing loss, and osteoarthritis. Furthermore, as people age, they are more likely to experience several conditions at the same time. Good morning, doctors. I am Yana Kasmin S. Daugdaug, and this morning I will be discussing about the psychiatric examination of geriatric patients. Showing you the overview of the discussion, my reference is Kaplan and Sadok's Synopsis of Psychiatry, 12th edition. Psychiatric history taking and the mental status examination of older adults follow the same format as for younger adults. However, because of the high prevalence of cognitive disorders in older persons, psychiatrists must determine whether a patient understands the nature and purpose of the examination. When a patient is cog cognitively impaired, an independent history should be obtained from a family member or caretaker. The patient still should be seen alone, even in cases of clear evidence of impairment, to preserve the privacy of the doctor patient relationship, and to elicit any suicidal thoughts or paranoid ideation, which may not be voiced in the presence of a relative or nurse. Starting with the psychiatric history, a complete psychiatric history is composed of the following. Preliminary identification, including name, age, sex, marital status, chief complaint, history of present illness, history of previous illnesses, personal history, family history, and review of medications. Review of medications includes over-the-counter medications, both current and recent. It's also worthy to note that patients older than age 65 often have subjective complaints of minor memory impairments, such as forgetting person's names and misplacing objects. Minor cognitive problems also can occur because of anxiety in the inter interview situation. These age-associated memory impairments are of no significance, and the term benign senescent forgetfulness has been used to describe them. A patient's childhood and adolescent history can provide information about personality organization and give important clues about coping strategies and defense mechanisms used under stress. A history of learning disability or a minimal cerebral dysfunction is significant. The psychiatrist should inquire about friends, sports, hobbies, social activity, and work. The occupational history should include the patient's feelings about work, relationships with peers, problems with authority, and attitudes toward retirement. The patient also should be questioned about plans for the future as well as the patient's hope and fears. The marital history includes a description of the spouse and the characteristics of the relationship. If the patient is a widow or a widower, the psychiatrist should explore how grieving was handled. If the loss of the spouse occurred within the past year, the patient is at high risk for an adverse physical or psychological event. The patient's sexual history includes sexual activity, orientation, libido, masturbation, extramarital affairs, and sexual symptoms, including impotence and anorgasmia. Young clinicians may have to overcome their own biases about taking a sexual history. Sexuality is an area of concern for many geriatric patients who welcome the chance to talk about their sexual feelings and attitudes. The family history should include a patient's description of parents' attitudes and adaptation to their old age and, if applicable, information about the causes of their deaths. Alzheimer's disease is transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait in 10 to 30% of the offspring of parents with Alzheimer's disease. Depression and alcohol dependence also run in families. The patient's current social situation should be evaluated. Who cares for the patient? Does the patient have children? What are the characteristics of the patient's parent-child relationships? A financial history helps the psychiatrist evaluate the role of economic hardship in the patient's illness and to make realistic treatment recommendations. With older adults, a psychiatrist may not be able to rely on a single examination to answer all of the diagnostic questions. Repeat mental status examinations may be needed because of fluctuating changes in the patient's family. 
So moving on to the first one, general description, and that would include appearance, psychomotor activity, attitude toward the examiner, and speech activity. Motor disturbances such as shuffling gait, stooped posture, wheel rolling movements of the fingers, tremors, and body asymmetry should be noted. Many depressed patients seem to be slow in speech and movement. Mask-like facies occurs in Parkinson's disease. The patient's attitude towards the examiner may be cooperative, suspicious, guarded, ingratiating. They can give clues about possible transference reactions. Because of transference, older adults can re react to younger physicians as if the physicians were parent figures, despite the age difference. The patient's speech may be pressured in agitated, manic, and anxious states. Tearfulness and overcrying occur in depressive and cognitive disorders, especially if the fa patient feels frustrated about being unable to answer one of the examiner's questions. The presence of a hearing aid or another indication that the patient has a hearing problem, such as requesting repetition of questions, should be noted. Patients older than 65 years old of age should be 65 years of age should be evaluated for their capacity to maintain independence and to perform the activities of daily life and that would include toileting preparing meals dressing grooming and eating and that would be under functional assessment the degree of functional competence in their everyday behaviors is an essential consideration in formulating a treatment plan for these patients next are the mood, feelings, and affect. Suicide is a leading cause of death of older persons, and an evaluation of a patient's suicidal ideation is essential. Loneliness is the most common reason cited by older adults who consider suicide. Feelings of loneliness, worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness are symptoms of depression, which carries a high risk of suicide. The examiner should specifically ask the patient about any thoughts of suicide. Does the patient feel that life is no longer worth living? Does the patient think he or she would be better off dead, or when dead, would no longer be a burden to others? Such thoughts, significantly when associated with alcohol abuse, living alone, the recent death of a spouse, physical illness, and somatic pain indicate a high suicidal risk. Disturbances in mood states, most notably depression and anxiety, can interfere with memory functioning. An expansive or euphoric mood may indicate a manic episode or may signal a dementing disorder. Frontal lobe dysfunction often produces Witzelschott, which is, which is the tendency to make puns and jokes and then laugh aloud at them. The patient's affect may be flat, blunted, constricted, shallow, or inappropriate, all of which can indicate a depressive disorder, schizophrenia, or brain dysfunction. Such affects are significant abnormal findings, although they are not pathognomonic of a specific disorder. Dominant lobe dysfunction causes dysprosody, an inability to express emotional feelings through speech intonation. Next are the perceptual distur disturbances. Hallucinations and illusions by older adults can be transitory phenomena resulting from decreased sensory activity. The examiner should note whether the patient is confused about time or place during the hallucinatory episode. Confusion points to an organic condition. It is also particularly important to ask the patient about distorted body perceptions. Because brain tumors and other focal pathology can cause hallucinations and a diagnostic workup may be indicated. Brain diseases could cause per perceptive impairments. Agnosia, the inability to recognize and interpret the significance of sensory impressions, is associated with organic brain diseases. The examiner should know the type of agnosia. Types of agnosia include denial of illness, also called anosognosia, denial of a body part, also called atopognosia, and inability to recognize objects, also called visual agnosia, or faces, prosopagnosia. Next is the language output. The language output category of the geriatric mental status examination covers the aphasias, which are disorders of language output related to organic lesions of the brain. The best described are non-fluent or broca aphasia. Fluent 
or Wernicke aphasia, and global aphasia, a combination of fluent and non-fluent aphasias. In non-fluent or broca aphasia, the patient's understanding remains intact, but the ability to speak is impaired. The patient cannot pronounce Methodist Episcopalian. Words are generally mispronounced and speech may be telegraphic. On the other hand, a simple test for Wernicke aphasia is to point to some everyday objects, such as a pen or a pencil, a doorknob, and a light switch, and ask the patient to name them. The patient also may be unable to dem demonstrate the use of simple objects, such as a key and a match, which is called idiomotor apraxia. Next is the visual spatial functioning. Some decline in visual spatial capability is expected with aging. Asking a patient to copy figures or a drawing may help assess the function. A neuropsychological assessment should be performed when visual spatial functioning is impaired. Thought content should be examined for phobias, obsessions, somatic preoccupations, and compulsions. Ideas about Suicide or homicide should be discussed, and the examiner should determine whether delusions are present and how such delusions affect the patient's life. Delusions may be present in nursing home patients and may have been a reason for admission. Ideas of reference or influence should be described. Patients who are hard of hearing can be classified mistakenly as paranoid or suspicious. Also, it is worthy to note that the loss of the ability to appreciate nuances of meaning, also called abstract thinking, may be an early sign of dementia. Thinking is then described as concrete or literal. Next is sensorium and cognition. Sensorium concerns the functioning of the special senses, while cognition concerns information processing and intellect. The survey of both areas, known as the neuropsychiatric examination, consists of the clinician's assessment and a comprehensive battery of psychological tests. A sensitive indicator of brain dysfunction is an altered state of consciousness in which the patient does not seem to be alert, shows fluctuations in levels of awareness, or seems to be lethargic. In severe cases, the patient is somnolescent or stuporous. Impairment in orientation to time, place, and person is associated with cognitive disorders. Cognitive impairment often is observed in mood disorders, anxiety disorders, factitious disorders, conversion disorder, and personality disorders, especially during periods of severe, severe physical or environmental stress. Memory usually is evaluated in terms of immediate, recent, and re remote memory. In cognitive disorders, recent memory deteriorates first. If the patient has a memory deficit such as amnesia, careful testing should be performed to determine whether it is retrograde amnesia or antero anterograde amnesia. Retention and recall also can be tested by having the patient retell a simple story. Patients who confabulate make up new material in retelling the story. In assessing intellectual tasks, information, and intelligence, the examiner must take into account the patient's educational level, socioeconomic status, and general life experience in assessing the results of, of some of these tests. And it may be necessary for the clinician to examine the patient's reading and writing and to determine whether the patient has a specific speech deficit. The examiner may have the patient read a simple story aloud or write a short sentence to test for a reading or writing disorder. Whether the patient is right-handed or left-handed should be noted. Judgment is the capacity to act appropriately in various situations. Does the patient show impaired judgment? What would the patient do on finding a stamped, sealed, addressed envelope in the street? What would, be the, pa what would the patient do if he or she smelled smoke in a theater? Moving on to neuropsychological evaluation. A thorough neuropsychological examination includes a comp comprehensive battery of tests that can be replicated by various examiners and can be repeated over time to assess the course of a specific illness. So these are some of the tools used in neuropsychological evaluation. The most widely used test of current cognitive functioning is the Mini Mental State Examination, or MMSE, which assesses orientation, attention, calculation, immediate and short-term recall, language, and, and the ability to follow simple commands. 
The MMSE is used to detect impairments, follow the course of an illness, and monitor the patient's treatment responses. It is not used to make a formal diagnosis. The maximal MMSE score is 30. Age and educational level influence cognitive performance. The assessment of intellectual abilities is performed with the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale Revised, or WASE R, which gives verbal performance and full scale IQ scores. Some test results, such as those of a vocabulary tests, hold up as aging progresses. Results of other tests, such as tests of similarities and digit symbol substitution, do not. The performance part of the ways R is a more sensitive indicator of brain damage than the verbal part. Visual spatial functions are sensitive to the normal aging process. The Bender Gestalt test is one of a large number of instruments used to test visual spatial functions. Another is the Halsted Wrighton battery, which is the most complex battery of tests covering the entire spectrum of information processing and cognition. The medical history includes all significant illnesses, trauma, hospitalizations, and treatment interventions. The psychiatrist should also be alert to underlying medical illness. Psychiatric symptoms may first manifest infections, metabolic and electrolyte disturbances, and myocardial infarction and stroke. Depressed mood, delusions, and hallucinations may precede other symptoms of Parkinson's disease by many months. On the other hand, a psychiatric disorder can also cause such somatic symptoms as weight loss, malnutrition, and inanition of severe depression. Drug effects can be long-lasting and may induce depression, such as the antihypertensives, cognitive impairments, such as the sedatives, delirium, such as anticholinergics, and seizures, such as the neuroleptics. The review of medications must include sufficient detail to identify misuse, such as overdo overdose or under underuse, and relate medication use to special diets. A dietary history is also essential. Deficiencies and excesses such as protein or vitamins can influence, influence physiologic function and mental status. Moving on to early detection and prevention strategies. The most common cause of late-life cognitive impairment Alzheimer's disease is characterized neuropathologically by a gradual accumulation of neuritic plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. Clinically, a progression of cognitive decline is seen, which begins with mild memory loss and ends with severe cognitive and behavioral deterioration. Because it will, be likely, it will likely be simpler to prevent neural damage than to repair it once it occurs, investigators are developing strategies for early detection and prevention of age-related illnesses, such as Alzheimer's disease. Considerable progress has been made in the detection component of this strategy using brain imaging te technologies, such as PET and fMRI, in combination with genetic risk measures. With these approaches, subtle brain changes can now be detected that progress and can be followed over time. Novel approaches to measuring the physical evidence of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles in the cerebral cortex, have been successful in initial studies and will likely facilitate the testing of innovative treatments designed to rid the brain of these pathognomonic lesions. Scientists may not be able to cure Alzheimer's disease in its advanced stages, but they may be able to delay its onset effectively, thus helping patients live longer without the Debilitating manifestations of the disease include cognitive decline. With all those in mind, still let us not forget that old age is not a defeat, but a victory. Not a punishment, but a privilege. Thank you and have a good day.